Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Neosystems Big Picture Cyber Town Hall. Now, I'd like to introduce your host, Ed Bassett from Neosystems. Ed? Thanks, Don. Welcome, everyone, to our continuing series of Cybersecurity Town Hall Ask Me Anything sessions. Uh, our guest today is Mary Jo Thomas. I also want to mention at the start that we are recording these sessions as part of our community outreach to the defense industrial base. Uh, also on the screen, we have our sketch note artist, Wade Forbes. He's making a visual record of this conversation, and we'll share that with everyone after the conclusion of, of today's session. Our focus at Neo Systems as a managed service provider is federal government contractors. That's primarily who we have in our audience here today. Um, I do want to suggest if you're in the audience, if you have some questions for MJ, please send those in on the Q&A feature within Zoom, and I'll work those into the conversation. I'll start with the introduction of Mary Jo Thomas. MJ is a, she has a distinguished career in government as an Air Force officer, a state police officer, and nearly 20 years in the FBI, focusing on counterintelligence and counterterrorism. She's now the Director of Security at General Dynamics Bath Ironworks, where she's managing all security functions, including cyber, industrial, and physical security. Needless to say, with this background, MJ is an expert in the protection of the weapons, technology, and intellectual property that underpin our national security. Um, MJ, thanks for, very much for joining us today. Hey, thanks, Ed. I'm, I'm glad to be back again. Yeah, it's been a while since you've been on this series, so welcome back. Um, you know, recently we've been talking a lot about uh, potential for cyber attacks on U.S. targets uh, from Russia specifically with the aggression that they're, they're carrying out in, the, in, the, in Ukraine. Um, the White House and CISA both have put out notices that are encouraging U.S. companies to really increase their cyber vigilance, bring that, bring that up a notch. Uh, the most recent statement put out a couple of weeks ago uh, from the White House said that intelligence points to Russia, quote, exploring options for potential cyber attacks, unquote. Um, today, we saw an announcement of some attacks within Ukraine. Um, how, how big a deal is this sort of statement coming out uh, from, you know, from the president and going to essentially all of, it, all of the US, all of industry? You know, I, I think it's a big deal. I think in the headline news we just saw, maybe it was just a couple of days ago that the FBI took down a whole entire botnet you know, network uh, that Russia had uh, put in place. And so I think they're taking, um, you know, all the government resources we currently have to focus on this, on this, uh, this real threat. So, you know, companies like General Dynamics and uh, other folks that are in the industry, you know, I'm in daily conversations with my team and connected to all the resources out there from CISA to Infragard to, um, um, other associations that we get a constant feed of things that we're seeing happen. And they're coming in uh, from kind of odd places. You know, one thing that we saw yesterday um, talking to, you know, the network and your network's very important is um, some companies have figured out that they've subbed capability out code writing and those subs have subbed it out to Russians. And so we're, yeah, we're just like amazed. And this is our whole conversation yesterday about what is this, what does this do? And this is a vector. This is another vector to get into. So I tell everybody, you know, you're just not one and done. I went through the list that they put out, the multi-factor authentication, all those things. And those should be like, you, you must have those done. But then there's also kinds of communications go, going out with the different vulnerabilities and different software packages and things. And then we work hard to make sure that we have all those patched up as well. So um, it's like water, you know, that you patch things up and then it goes to a, another place, you know, that finds its way in. And so that's what we're really doing right now is looking to identify any potential leak that we could potentially suffer some kind of attack or compromise. Yeah, I mean, CIS has been putting out, you know, vulnerability lists they've been updating, it seems mm -hmm. pretty, pretty frequently. And these are things that they're seeing active exploitation. So along with that um, statement that the, the president put out, the White House also released a fact sheet. You just mentioned it. It had eight steps in there that each right. company should take. And they said with urgency, right? Do this stuff now. Most of these MFA you mentioned, you know, they're, they're mostly familiar ground. Um, the one item at the end of the list, the last item uh, was a little bit interesting to me. It, it, it encouraged proactive engagement with CISA and the FBI in advance mm -hmm. of cyber incidents was their specific yes. wording, in advance of incidents. So not, not the after the fact reporting that is you know, required uh, by DOD and now required you know, in the new, new law for critical infrastructure, but in advance of incidents, 
Um, so from, from your experience with the FBI, how valuable is this sort of before the fact engagement in terms of you know, proving the resilience uh, of, well, of industry that's, that's participating and then on the government side as well? I think it's incredibly uh, valuable because they're, they're, you know, the FBI cyber is partnered with other federal organizations to collaborate and identify vulnerabilities, but they also identify how bad guys got into systems and they put out bulletins. I get emails maybe once, twice a day from FBI InfraGuard uh, making us aware of cyber scams or schemes and smishing and phishing and every different type of thing that's going on out there to possibly get somebody in your system from compromises on LinkedIn for gift card compromises. They're constantly putting out information to people to make sure they don't get scammed through different criminal organizations. So I encourage everybody just to kind of look it up and see and apply to InfraGuard and get yourself on those daily notifications. And that, you know, I think the idea of, of sharing in advance, um, uh, you know, really engaging beyond just getting the bulletins, but, but a two-way sharing engagement, that would be a big shift for a lot of companies. A lot of people that we work with are very reticent to share any of their operational security details with anyone, let alone the government. And they really want to do the minimum that's required by law, if you will. So how do we shift that around? How do we incentivize companies to be more open about what they're experiencing so that you know they feed that process and then, then get back the benefits from that? So this is like, uh, we've talked about this in the past and people always talk to me about how the banking sector did so well at this post 9-11 when we were looking at terrorist financing. And I would tell you, the banking sector was kind of like we are today, like people don't really want to communicate. You know, one bank doesn't want to tell another bank, you know, how they're identifying bad accounts or potential terrorist financing within their system because they're afraid of the shareholders and the account holders. And I just kind of got frustrated one day with them. I said, listen, if you secretly kick a person out, but don't tell your industry, they just change colors and they come back to you eventually. You know what I mean? We all have to get in a room and we just have to talk about, listen, we just got hit. This is how they came in. This is what their, their MO was. We want to share it with you, our community, so you can protect yourself. The banking sector is so robust now and very transparent with each other about making sure um, that the industry knows how the bad guy tries to come in. We need to kind of create that community here as well. And, and we're doing it here today. We need to partner together and say, listen, we just figured out they've found a loophole or a place to get in. We want to tell you all how we identified it and how we we blocked it so that you can go look for it ahead of it before it comes to you. So we just need to get over the sharing part of it. You don't have to give up your state secrets or your intellectual property. People might have a better idea for you as a, on a software solution or security program that they've identified that you might want to consider. So we've got an interesting audience question about on the share, kind of the sharing topic. And this mm -hmm. audience member says, one thing I've always heard is that it's good to limit the amount of information on websites, especially DOD compliance, as it would hot flag potential bad actors to target a company. What are your thoughts on commercializing and marketing versus cybersecurity? Like how do you, how do you as a company say, I'm doing well on security, I'm doing good, and share this information. Um, without you know being a target, becoming a target because of it. Oh, I think that 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 person is spot on. I, I'm more conservative about. I want security. I mean, you know, it's a balanced marketing. But I think we saw this with Solar Winds. You know, when you went to their website, they put on everybody that was their customer. It was like a shopping list. You know, all these people are using our software, so the bad guy could go to all these companies. And, and do the same thing they were doing to get into their systems. Um, I've said, we have to make sure that we aren't, we, if we do business with a company, you know, I don't want my company name now, General Dynamics on their website, you know, it's prohibited. Um, you have to get, you know, through the communications department, certain authorities to use our logo uh, on your website anyway, but it's become a thing now, like we don't want to do that. So, you know, it's risk management, you know, you want to market your capability, but you don't have to market your capability, capability with your security software, you know, security provider, you market it somewhere else, you know, where your whatever widget thing that you're creating. So um, I do not want us uh, being advertised with our security solutions. I think that's what he's asking. Yeah. So um, I want to drill into the counterintelligence side of things a little bit. 
um, thinking about sharing, you know, talking with FBI and, and others. So you've talked about the benefits of incorporating a counterintelligence viewpoint, but a lot of companies in the DIB, especially smaller ones, they don't have direct access to that kind of specialized knowledge. They don't, they don't have MJ Thomas on, on, their, on their team. Um, so sharing is one of those things where they could potentially tap into those capabilities within the government, FBI or elsewhere. How do, how do we do that? So, you know, when the president think comes out and says, let's engage proactively ahead of time, one of the things I want to do as a company is when I engage, I want to get something back. So I want to maybe get access to that counterintelligence viewpoint. How, how, do, how do I do that? So it, it is important, and I'm, I'm currently trying to put it with within my company and, and you're right I'm, unfortunately you know i'm not saying this in a but i'm kind of a weird unicorn that I, there aren't a lot of me or a lot of people continuing to develop like this um we are fighting kind of we're fighting a counterintelligence war it's an asymmetric war that we're, we're doing right now whether it's with russia or china and the only people that are good at looking out are those counterintelligence people where, you know, the CIO and the, they're, they're looking down, making sure the network connectivity and all the patches are in. The best pipeline these days for Intel people is the military. You know, there's so many programs right now with SkillBridge and what is it called? Uh, for, but there's a bunch of them and if later on we need them and we're bringing them in. So these people that are counterintelligence people or uh, computer people, they're looking to separate from the military six months uh, ahead of time. So you actually get free labor for six months. So we're pulling them into our cybersecurity program and it teaches my people to think about things a different way. We're also getting involved with um, um, I don't know what the official term is, I'm trying to think in the private sector, but war games. So I've collaborated with the military to say, listen, I'd like to get my team to work on your team, like blue on red or whatever, that we're constantly exercising. If they learn from us in the private sector, we learn from them. So the continued networking, I don't really think sometimes you have to pay for it all. You just have to like reach out and collaborate with uh, the Department of Defense, they, they want to learn how to kind of fight a cyber war from the private sector. But there's also opportunities for you to acquire professionally trained intelligence people by uh, collaborating with the military in these skill bridge programs. Cool. Um, so th there's a new law that just came out uh, just now, been just a few weeks ago, um, with mandatory cyber incident reporting requirements for critical infrastructure owners and operators. So that very similar to what the DOD has been doing broadly for a long time, um, but now this is across the civil sector as well. Um, significant expansion of CISA's view of the threat landscape, right? Because of this required reporting, they're going to see things they might have not been aware of before. Right. Um, how should companies think about the role of CISA versus FBI if they're engaging this proactive engagement that the White House is suggesting? What's, you know, what should, how should they think about those two agencies? how to engage, what to engage about, that sort of thing. So I think it, this is gonna be helpful. It sounds uh, maybe intrusive, but it goes back to my example with the banking industry. All this is trying to do is collect all the different pieces of information, you know, about companies who suffer from ransomware or some denial service, whatever the attack is, and they can collectively can start to build the defense program against it. You know, the FBI is looking for accountability. Usually by the time, you know, we're getting involved, like you see with the folks from China that have been indicted or the Russians, you know, kind of like the horse has left the barn. On. And so I think the collaboration now between like FBI, CISA, NSA, it's really trying to be more proactive and try to identify things ahead of time. So that's why I was really happy to see the, the whole bot network kind of taken out ahead of time before anybody suffered any losses uh, of anything. So it's a different partnership, like one's, one's collecting and pushing out information like CISA is, the FBI is doing the actual investigations, you know, they get the, you know, the the search warrants, they, they look in, they interview people, they figure out how things are done, they get to get the computers and forensics and everything, and then share with everybody. And so I think they're doing not two entirely separate things, but they're doing separate things based on their authorities, but then they're collaborating together to share information. So I think this new uh, law is gonna be incredibly beneficial for us across the board. And that new law is still after the fact, though, right? It's still reporting incidents that have oh, occurred yeah. and ransomware payments you've made. So you just mentioned, you know, the idea of taking out this botnet that requires some before the fact reporting, right? Somebody saying, "Hey, I 
I have not yet had an incident, but I see this suspicious behavior going on. Um, so it sounds like you're sort of advocating to shift to more before the fact sharing. Oh yeah. Where we're reporting things that are that are not yet a breach or incident don't meet that definition. Yeah, I mean, I don't know exactly how this whole thing got identified, but if like some victim company said, "I oh, know this this thing," you know, is on our system, then, you know, the folks could probably came in and said, "Oh my God, this is a great opportunity for us to figure out how broad this network is." If you just take out that one computer, then they're still all out there in the wild, but if you kind of take it and work and figure out how this network is operating, you're able to neutralize the network, which is, is obviously highly impactful. The goal is always to be proactive. I tell everybody, we're never gonna be 100%, but if we can prevent something from happening or we can like minimize the risk to our system, that should ultimately be the goal. And that's what I'm trying to turn people around from. Everybody's trying to say, you know, how do we recover? You know, what's going to be our business continuity plan? You know, how will we back up our systems? Or bring? Why don't we? Why don't we work towards these things never happening to us? And we can do this by collaborating. So much like I, the example I used with the banking industry, they would figure out like store valued cards were being abused and PayPal was being abused and the selling of art was being ab abused. But those were key indicators. And then we started sharing them with everybody. So people were like, aha, this is one of those things that they talked about that bad guys will potentially use to try to move money. We'll make sure we block that. And that's what I think we can do in this community too. That's cool. I mean, today we have, you know, looking at what CISA has up, for example, these are email web forms you can fill out. These are pretty low bandwidth mechanisms for mm -hmm. reporting. So if we want to get to the kind of proactive operational sharing that you're talking about, I mean, you know, like we, what you mentioned, the banks are doing, these could be a large volume of data. Is, is the government ready for this? Are companies ready for this? Like, are, are we ready to do that kind of high volume stuff? Or it, well, if not, what do we need to do to get ready for it? So, I mean, I don't think everybody's uh, ready. I mean, I don't think we're ready today, but I'm starting the conversation. You know, I talk at, about low level things with my team um, and they're purely kind of IT cybersecurity people. They are not counterintelligence people, but the things I've, I've opened their eyes up to, we've actually identified a lot of bad things that potentially could have happened before they even came to our system. And this had to do with like, this is the quasi supply chain area I get into, is that we have, uh, you know, manufacturing wants to go to a more automated system, you know, we want remote access and things like that. But, you know, in the scope of we're a defense contractor, um, you know, we might buy a big piece of equipment from Germany and then, you know, we have to have calibration done on it re uh, remotely. My concern is I have no idea who's on the other end of that, who's reading the calibration of the amount of thickness of the steel that we put on the hulls on our destroyers. You know, that information in the wrong hands could do bad things. You know what I mean? This is a supply chain, cyber thing, vetting thing. All these things are blending together. My frustration with companies right now is they're always trying to find that single solution, turn it on, and then we're all set. You, this is not a problem that you can fix once and forget about. You need to be working with supply chain and, and IT and cybersecurity. It's legal, it's acquisitions, it research and engineering. Um, these all get blended together. And I think this is where an Intel person who understands how spying works could benefit companies. I, I agree. I mean, we're in the operations business too. It is about operating and how you operate every day, not about what tool you bought last month that might yeah. be the greatest thing, but it's about how do you operate. You know, one of the promises of this information sharing is that we get situational awareness that lets us collectively respond better. And I think we saw a really great example of that with Solar Winds, where you know a victim company FireEye was 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 attacked. They were very open about what they saw. They shared it with the government, with other people in industry. And we, as a group, we all did better in figuring out quickly what was going on and, and defending against it. Um, you know, we know our attackers are well coordinated. It makes sense that us as defenders, we need to be well coordinated as well. So help us maybe walk through that a little bit. This, the, what you were just talking about, this, you know, the idea of a coordinated defense, right? Where you mentioned the, the, the financial services industry doing better at that than maybe the DIB, the DIB is doing. What does a coordinated defense look like and how should we be moving in that? You know, how do we move in that direction, right? So where it's companies and government working together in a common way. 
Um, I, I would tell you, you know, I abbreviated that whole thing. It, it, it wasn't like I had one conversation, the bank said like, okay, we're in, you know what I mean? It was, <laughs> it, it was, it was a lot of conversations, a lot of briefing investigations, you know, getting buy-in from one bank to share with like a group of, of you know, 10 banks about, we all need to know about this, you know, this is bad. And then in constantly, constantly meeting with them. I got invited to their annual meetings. We and the FBI created, I, I think it was a quarterly uh, banking meeting. So the, the FBI would brief them on the latest things we're finding from FinCEN and things like that. And then it just became, everybody became a team. And then, you know, two banks would call each other. You know, I became friends with a lot of these people because we now we're a trusted network. We're not competing with each other for our, what we do in the banking sector, but we're safe as a community because we're all sharing. And much like you said, with the solar winds, I think there have been investigations of theft of intellectual property and the victim company who's lost millions of dollars has come forward and they brief constantly because they never want to see this happen to anyone else again. Um, I think that's where we need to go. That's why I'm sitting with you guys here today. It's like, I want to talk about this and I want to figure out a way that we can come together as a community, protect us up. We'll never do it in silos, never. Good, maybe we're starting a movement. So <laughs> one, of, <laughs> one of the recommendations in that White House fact sheet was um, um, a little different angle here than we've been talking about, was running drills of our emergency plans, um, really practicing for the you know, eventuality that you, you might have a successful attack. Um, is that something that you've been doing internally and, and what, what are some of the benefits that you're expecting from looking at emergency plans, really practicing those up? Oh, so I do it all the time. Like I do, and it was in that, like I do uh, regular pen testing, tabletop exercises. I work with IT, like how's our data being backed up? You know, I, I come up, I'm not a trained IT person, but I want things, you know, we're dealing with protecting CUI. I want things compartmentalized. You know, we're doing paver analytics. I want to see what's going on in my network, you know? So, you know, I, I thoroughly irritate my people in a very good way. Like, come on guys, we've got to start thinking like a bad guy. Um, but I saw that chat that just popped up about funding. Did you see that? Oh. Another great question. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll bring it up. Yeah. Yeah. So I just said this like two weeks ago, like, and I'm, you know, you know, when I, when the, when the Department of Defense comes to, you know, General Dynamics Bath Ironworks, I get locked in the closet, like, don't let her out until they leave. You know? <laughs> because I said, you know, I've said it to high level people at the Pentagon, if you want to take security, I'm not just talking cybersecurity or physical security, inside a threat and supply chain, acquisitions, non-traditional collectors, all these vectors, you want to take these seriously, you have to fund it. You have to put it in the contract. You have to have security, whatever you want to call that, enterprise risk or security or the really security, counterintelligence, smart person at the table during the negotiations to say, wait a minute, I don't think we can do that. Um, and I said that to the president here. I said, listen, you really should consider it because you, you cut a deal and then your, all your security infrastructure, whatever that is from supply chain to physical security, finds themselves in a bind, not being able, able to execute the right security program to safeguard this particular Department of Defense uh, asset or intellectual property. Um, and I swear I'll retire when I, when I, when I get that done. I, I want security in the contract. I want it funded. I think security shouldn't be a cost center. We're, we're something good, especially because we work for the Department of Defense or we're a defense contractor. You're here. Uh, let me read the, I'm gonna read the audience member because I'm not sure everybody can see it. I don't know if it's just us panelists that can see it. Um, so I'll read it out. One of the, it says the audience member said, one of the big problems with cybersecurity is that organizations limit funds dedicated to it, which means limiting the number of systems operating in that holistic approach that MJ encourages. What levers could be used to get purchasers over the hump? And I think you, you were just calling out for, you know, get it in the contract, call it something other than a sort of a hidden cost, right? Get it out in the open where people can see why you're doing it and what the benefits are. Yeah, and I'm not shy about it. I, I am hunting for bad things in, in my company all the time and I find them all the time and I present them all the time. And the senior executives are like, Oh my God, how did you find this? Um, like just a really easy example. 
and I'm just giving this away for free. We, we ordered three new servers to run our new kind of cybersecurity programs that we had acquired. Um, and so I've been really excited about seeing these new tools used. And I keep asking the team, where, where are the servers? Where are the servers? Well, apparently the servers got lost in shipping for three weeks. I said, don't ever put those servers on our system. Okay, so I reached out, I looked up the third party vendor. Now, if you guys like follow like Made in China 2025 or any of that, a lot of small shipping companies been acquired by China. All right, right. so I, I called the FBI, you know, we're not allowed to talk about cases anymore, but I just said, thumbs up or thumbs down. This is my situation. These servers showed up and I don't want to hook to my network. I don't have a forensic capability to like look at these servers and say there's a bug on them. And they just get back to me and said, uh, don't hook those to your, your network, MJ. So I asked the IT people, if I wasn't here, would you have hooked those to the network? And they said, yeah, we would have. Sure, yeah. So you right. can do all <laughs> yeah. your fancy, expensive security, whatever. And if it's intercepted before it even reaches you, it doesn't really matter. But only a counterintelligence person would think that because we know in counterintelligence that that's how things are put on technology. They're intercepted. Yeah, if they were missing for three weeks, why did that happen, right? Right. Random, exactly. maybe. On purpose, maybe. maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so let me, you were bringing up about supply chain earlier and, and, and some of the, the notion that when you start looking down deep into that supply chain, you see, okay, well, I hired these guys to do the software and then they hired somebody and then now they're hiring some people that are in Russia. And that's, you, you may not even be aware of that at the top of the, at the top of the food chain. So as you, as you think about those sectors that you, you want to focus on within your supply chain, are there some that you feel are more critical and, and where, I mean, you mentioned software development. Is that one? Are there others that are where you say, hey, I want to really make sure we're focused on that part of the supply chain? Yeah. And so we've had conversations because we're trying to get to a more kind of automated system in the in the yard and they want to order, so, you know, have software written to do things. And um, I want it in the contract exactly who it's subbed out to and who it's subbed out to. You know, I don't care how deep we go. And I also said it cannot be subbed at any level to a designated country, or if it needs to be subbed, they have to come back to us. So I'm not an attorney, but I've told legal that I want this written in a way that we get top cover for it. Um, I understand from my people, and there's a lot of probably cyber professionals on the call today, that there's a lot of like code out there in the wild that gets written like overseas. Um, but I don't want to find us in a solo win position again, where the actual compromise is baked into my solution. So it might be happening, but you know, I want to be in a position of um, managed risk. I want to be able to know that this is the risk I'm assuming, instead of just blindly putting something out there in the wild, and all of a sudden we put it on our system and and something happens. Um, and then I have, I'd rather do all the front end work in the beginning than, than on the back end, figure out what went wrong in our system. So I'm very much about at two o'clock today, I have another phone call with my team about another project where they want to write code. It, well, I mean, the log4j vulnerabilities really even yeah. more so than solar winds brought that because this is some software that you know, if you saw that on your software bill of materials, you wouldn't think twice about it. Everybody was using Log4j, right? It was used mm -hmm. all over the place. And then that's, you know, that's where the, the problem is. And now we go to fix it. We got to fix essentially everything. We had products right. in all different aspects of, of the business that are affected by it. And, and that was true for almost everybody, right? It was just widely distributed. So this new rule about having a bill of materials now for software code, I don't think it'll cure the problem, but whenever we do have some kind of compromise or a potential issue, at least the team will know where to go to fix it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that was a big problem with Log4j is it was in things you didn't expect it to be in, right? right. The name of the product wasn't Log4j, it was, right. it was anything. And then it buried down in deep is this is what they're using because it was a general purpose utility. So we're, we're near the end of our time. I want to ask uh, kind of a closing, closing question. Always try to get it, bring it back to some action oriented advice um, that you could give to our audience today. Senior executives, board members, folks like that, that are thinking about, you know, actions they should take um, in response to the, some of these suggestions we're getting of, we got to bring our vigilance up, right? There's, there's, there's things right around the corner, maybe happening today that we should be concerned about. 
I, I think what the three things I would take away is we need to start working like a team. You know what I mean? We have to like use my example, like back in the nine post 9-11 days and start sharing things. Um, you know, even this is the great product. We used it. It helped us find bad things. You might want to consider it. You know, we all need to push to get security, enterprise risk, whatever the word you want to use. It needs to be at the table. It needs to be properly funded. We can't like solve problems on a shoestring to protect our companies and their intellectual property. You know, and, and then the third thing is you really need to figure out a way to get some counterintelligence folks in your shop. And the military is the best way. They've months and years of training. Um, and it's for the first six months is free. And if you like that person, it gives you the justification to show some statistical accomplishments to your senior manager to say, hey, if not for this guy, we wouldn't have found these dozens of things. I think this is worth taking this person or this gal on full time. So those are the three things I would focus on as we end our conversation today. Cool. Thank you. I, I want to see if we can figure out a way to get counterintelligence as a service. We could buy it yes. uh, by the drink as opposed to hiring <laughs> to hire, you know, units of one human at a time because this is really a specialized skill set right it is it is so you know it's it's one step at a time you know what i mean and the thing is i sell even me i have to get involved in everything because even though you were at the the tip of the spear you know 18 months ago you know if you just sit in your office and swim in your own soup for five years i mean am i really ever getting any better you know um i need to always stay on top of my game and i think we all do Excellent. I agree. And that's not one of the reasons that I like doing this series. It, it keeps me engaged in a lot of things that um, I'm not going to find by sitting and looking at my own desk or my own, de my own desktop and see what's going on there. So thank you for your insights. It really, really informative. Um, thanks to the audience members for the great, great questions that, they, that you sent in and for your time and attention. Uh, thanks to Wade for, for drawing this for us. Uh, everyone in the audience, please join us for future cybersecurity town hall meetings. Um, you may have noticed we've moved to a bi-weekly schedule for the series. So our next session is going to be Wednesday, April 27th at 1 p.m. Eastern. Keep an eye out for the invitation in your inbox. If you don't see it there, you can visit our website, neosystemscorp.com for the details. Thanks very much.